Like, the miracles of Christ, one of the purpose of miracles, is, I guess the main purpose of miracles, is to authenticate the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. And of course this is very, very important because Jesus was not the first one to come to claim to be the Messiah. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you pay attention over here on what I wrote over here. It said, Miracles of Christ are Miracles of the Christ. Which is really what the title should be. Uh, most colleges, they have Miracles of Christ. If they have Miracles of Christ class, they say Miracles of Christ. Uh, but we wouldn't say Miracles of the Jesus. But we should say Miracles of the Christ. Because the word Christ means anointed one. Uh, miracles of the Messiah. You know, it, that means an anointed one. Uh, but Jesus was not the first one who came to claim to be the Messiah. But the Old Testament did prophesy that when Jesus came, that he would be followed with signs and, and miracles would take place. Uh, and then the apostles, because you know the Jews had the Old Testament, what we you know, we call the Jews called the Tanakh, but what we know is 39 books of the Old Testament, uh, and that's all the information they had. And suddenly somebody comes up and says, "Your way of life has now changed. You don't offer up a sacrifice anymore." Uh, and this is going to happen. Well, you know, if, if you're a saved person during that time, you still would need proof. You know, wait a minute. My Bible says that we're supposed to do this. Now, you tell me we don't have to anymore? Mm, you got to prove that to me. And so God told them there would be signs to follow. And then Hosea even predicted that uh, there would be Gentiles involved in it. Hosea 1.11. Uh, uh, they would uh, be involved. So uh, they needed to proof of that. And so Jesus came and did authenticate his ministry and the apostles. Uh, John, John's purpose in writing, uh, talks about to produce faith. It says, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Uh, I've read different things like uh, so-called book I can't remember if it was the book of Stephen or the book of Thomas they were so-called books of the Bible uh, and what we would call apocrypha meaning they're not really biblical books uh, but one of them claimed that when Jesus was a little boy that he was with some friends at the uh, ocean and he reached down picked up some sand and he breathed life into it and it became a bird and flew off uh, did that happen? no we know that didn't happen. However, though, how many people did Jesus raise from the dead? We don't know. Could have been 20, couldn't it? Because there are other things that are written that aren't in the book. But as far as Jesus turned that bird, we know that didn't happen because the Bible says in John chapter 2 that the miracle at Cana, turning the water and the wine at Cana, was his first miracle. And so there could not have been anything that happened before that. But as far as after that, there's a lot of things that we don't, we don't have a clue about. Uh, you know, how many people in the Old Testament ascended up in heaven without dying? Well, there's two named. Could there be others? Yeah. Right. Uh, as long as it doesn't contradict the Bible, like that Jesus making a bird before the marriage of Canaan. No, that didn't happen because that contradicts the Bible. But there could have been other things that did happen. But miracles weren't for everyone. You know, as far as we know, it was just the immediate group. Uh, there may have been some. Of course, there were prophets at that time. Uh, in Jesus' day, there were still prophets. The prophets did not go away until the Bible was complete. And so there was a lot of different things taking place to prove, just like the languages. Uh, remember, Paul was up at Ephesus in Acts chapter 17 and met some people that were disciples of John. And uh, who were believers, but he asked them about the Holy Spirit, and they thought, well, What are you talking about? We don't know anything about that. And then he had the gift of tongues to verify to them that what he was saying was of the Lord. And so the signs were given, again, to authenticate. Uh, they, in reality, uh, Jesus didn't raise Lazarus from the death so he'd be alive because he died again. He raised him from the dead to prove uh, that he was who he said he was. 
uh, and as well as others in it as well. So signs or miracles were also given to show Jesus' unique relationship with God. As I mentioned earlier in the other class, that I don't understand the Trinity. I believe the Trinity. Uh, it's, it's easy to, to believe. Uh, the Bible is very clear about the doctrine of the Trinity, so I have no problem with it whatsoever. Uh, anybody who denies it, I don't know how they can not deny it, say that they've read the Bible, but I don't understand it. But the reason I don't understand is because He's God. If we could understand everything about God, He's not much of a God. I mean, He would be nothing. Uh, Acts 2 says, You men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. So Peter here is telling him, he said, you know about Jesus, you saw what happened. He performed miracles. Why? Because God said that he would come perform miracles, and he did this proof of God uh, to verify to you that Jesus is truly the Messiah. The first miracle that we see is the miracle at Cana. I know a lot of people have a hard time with this passage because it talks about wine. Uh, I'm a teetotaler. I think all people should be teetotalers. I don't think there's any reason for us to drink alcohol uh, as a beverage. Uh, and I say I qualify that because I don't see anything wrong with people taking NyQuil. Uh, it contains alcohol, but it's a medicine. Uh, what did Paul tell Timothy to do? Take a little wine for his stomach's sake. Uh, was wine in the Bible alcoholic? Yeah, it was. It, you know, I think it's dangerous when we, I, I know it's dangerous that we change the Bible because we don't want people to drink. And I, I know people do that. In fact, um, one of the things I have now, she's at Pensacola uh, Christian College. And one professor down there said that, that if Jesus actually turned the water into wine, then that proves that Jesus was a fake and a liar. And I'm thinking, that's dangerous right there. Uh, I don't have a problem with that he turned water into wine. People living in those days, they didn't have the choices that we have today. Uh, we have refrigeration today, they did not have it. We have purification today, they did not have that. Uh, if you live near the Mediterranean, I mean, have you ever been to the beach and drank water? Yeah, it's salty. It's salty. I mean, even though it's supposed to be fresh water, it's still salty. Uh, it permeates through the whole area. Well, you know, one side of Israel is the Mediterranean, the other side is the salt sea. The, the water sources were, I'm sure, contaminated somewhat by the salt. Um, now, when they partook of the Lord's table, the Bible is very clear that they were not to use wine, but they were to use grape juice. Grape juice, in fact, the Bible, in reference to the Lord's table, when Jesus spoke of it, he talked about the fruit of the vine. You know, we know in 1 Corinthians that the, uh, 11, that the church of Corinth used uh, alcohol because they were getting drunk, and God condemns them for that. And Ephesians says, Be not drunk with wine, where it's in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, again, what Jesus is saying, in fact, I, I don't use that verse to say not to drink. I use that verse to say there's a lot of things we're not supposed to do. Anything that controls us other than the Holy Spirit of God is a sin. Uh, I've known too many people who say, Well, uh, I, I'm not an alcoholic. I can quit drink any time I want to. And... Alcohol doesn't bother me. And, and I see their life and say, yeah, it does. Absolutely does. I mean, I know somebody right now, they're uh, an alcoholic, and they go a long time without drinking, and then they'll start back drinking because other family members drink wine. And so they think, well, if they drink it, then it's okay for me to drink it. And then he's back drunk again, uh, causing all kinds of problems with the family and marriage and everything. And yet this family still drinks wine in front of him, and he goes back to drinking it. It's just, it's sad. Uh, my family is a family of alcoholics. 
I've seen too many people in my family die from alcohol. Uh, my dad did, my uncles did. Uh, I mean, it's just a mess. Um, so I'm, I do not promote drinking in any way whatsoever. But I'm not going to say that this was not wine, because historically we know that it was. There are two words for wine in the Bible. There's a Greek word oinos, which is every single time in the Bible except for Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 uses the word glucose. Now glucose was a, uh, a highly fermented wine, maybe a distilled wine. Uh, the other wine was a natural process. You take grape juice, it sets a while, and it starts naturally fermenting and naturally producing a certain amount of alcohol. But it was very low alcohol. It wasn't, uh, people weren't drinking it to get drunk. Uh, that's why they were drinking it because that's the only healthy thing they could find. Uh, that's stored for any period of time. Because if it's stored too long, it would turn to vinegar. And so it would make it so they, they couldn't turn it at, uh, at all. So, like I said, I don't have a problem with this, but again, I, I know people get mad at me for saying that. I've had people get real upset saying, well, I'm, he teaches it's okay to drink. I never said that in any way whatsoever. Uh, today we have, you know, I, the question that we ask today should not be, can I drink alcohol? The question should be, why should I drink alcohol? What benefit would it be for me to drink alcohol? Because first of all, my responsibility is greater to other people than it is to myself. Uh, I've had several doctors tell me, because of my health issues, that I need to take a, uh, a glass of white wine, about half a glass of white wine each night, and drink it before I go to bed. And I said, do you think that would help? They said, yeah. I said, what would happen if I just drank grape juice. They said, well, it has the same properties in it that would be beneficial to you. So, so that would be a, uh, just as good. Well, yeah, I guess it would. You know, but they drink alcohol, so they think everybody else is going to drink alcohol. There's no need for me to drink alcohol. Uh, I don't even drink grape juice, but <laughs> uh, there's no, no purpose in it. And the only thing that would happen if I drank alcohol, it'd be a detriment to others. It'd be hard for me to tell you people that they shouldn't drink if I drink. And in our churches today, if we use zero wine at that communion, uh, anybody under 21 years old could not partake of the Lord's table because it, that's a crime. You know, we don't have that uh, right to uh, uh, give alcohol to underage uh, people. But again, the Bible doesn't say to drink wine for the Lord's table. It says to use fruit of the vine. And so, but the problem with this passage is we center in on wine and we forget the, the purpose of the story. Right? The purpose of the story is, is very important uh, because it is the beginning of the miracles. And Jesus here is with his mother, he's with the disciples. They came from Galilee, so uh, not, they're not too far from Nazareth at this point. In fact, about four miles from uh, northeast of Nazareth. Um, so they, they came from Galilee, which, which is not the direction of Nazareth. And I guess they were heading back towards Nazareth at the time. So they were together, Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. So the disciples are here. Uh, he's gathering together his disciples. Uh, as far as that, beginning his earthly ministry. And that's the significance of Canaan. This is the beginning of his ministry. He was 30 years old at the time. Um, the time of the year, we know when this was. This would have been uh, uh, the first month of the Jewish calendar, which in our, today we'd probably say either March or April. Um, we know that because right after the marriage of Canaan, he had to leave and he had to go to Jerusalem. And the reason he had to go to Jerusalem is because Passover was coming up. Which meant that he started his ministry and ended his ministry at the time of Passover. So three years. Uh, I believe, and this is a guess, okay, so you know, I, uh, I can't prove this, uh, but when was Jesus born? Uh, 
where I get my Christmas tree from off of Highway 158, the uh, guy has Christmas tree farm and he also raises sheep. And when I was over getting the Christmas tree, I noticed this sheep had red paint on the side of them. And so I asked him why red paint on some of them. He said, well, those are the ones that actually have been impregnated. And uh, so he said, we always separate those from the other sheep. And I said, well, they're impregnated. I said, so uh, when do they give birth? He said, well, they won't give birth for a few more months. I said, so about March or April? He said, yeah. I said, so then you have to watch over them by night. He said, yeah, yeah, we always watch them by night when we give birth. I said, that's exactly what happened in the Bible, isn't it? And this guy turned out to be a Christian, and so we got talked about that. And he said, yeah, he said, that's in the Bible, uh, the sheep give birth around March or April, so when Jesus was born, it probably was that time of the year. And when I narrow it down, this is my guess, okay, just take it for what it's worth. We do know that Passover is the first day, 14th, first month, 14th day. And we know the Passover lamb is selected on the first month, the 10th day. So I think it's possible Jesus was born on the first month, the 10th day, because he's the Passover lamb. So that's, that's a guess, okay. I, I'm sure some people don't want to argue with you over it. But I do believe very strongly that he was born at the time of Passover. We know the first miracle is at the time of Passover. We know his death was at the time of Passover. So Jesus would have been 33 years old when he died. Uh, some people say 32 and a half. And they, the reason they say that is because they say, well, if he was born in December and he died in March or April, that's you know about a half a year. Well, he wasn't born in December. We know that, and we know why December 25th was picked. It was picked because Constantine wanted to join all religions together, pagan and Christian together, and unite them to celebrate on the same day. And they picked the winter solstice on December 25th in particular. So uh, December 25th definitely wasn't the day that he was born. Uh, but uh, it's not wrong for us to celebrate his birth then, because we don't know exactly what day he was born anyway. And the Bible doesn't really speak of celebrating his birth. It does of celebrating the resurrection. Uh, in fact, the early Christians uh, in this country uh, uh, banned Christmas. Uh, they said it was a pagan uh, holiday and we shouldn't do it. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I think we should do it right and, and truly worship Jesus and not celebrate Santa Claus like we do. Uh, but, you know, center in on Jesus. I don't have a problem with Santa Claus. I don't have a problem with Bugs Bunny. Okay. They're, they're just inanimate objects. But I do have a problem with uh, emphasizing that over, over Jesus. I mean, Jesus is, should be the center of all of it. Uh, and the other, if you want to uh, put a Santa Claus in your yard, I don't care. You know, but you know, we should celebrate Jesus. Of course, Mary's invited, and Jesus' and disciples were invited in John chapter 2. And so, yeah, apparently, this is a huge feast, a huge marriage. Uh, that they were all invited to. And the wine ran out. Now, Mary notified Jesus of this event. Said so when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said to them, well, they have no wine. Now, Jesus' response, and when we read this, we have to understand that the way we speak today is not the way that mankind has always spoken. Uh, the terms we use today. Because Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Now, when you were a little boy, your mama said something to you, and you said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? After you got yourself up off the floor, because she probably smacked you, you know, you can learn not to say that again. But this is not a harsh statement. To us, it sounds like disrespectful. But in that day and time, that was a normal statement about, well, Mom, what do you want me to do? You know, my hour is not yet come. Now, this is a problem here to some people, this phrase, my hour is not yet come. And it's a problem because later on, Jesus would use it in reference to the, his death. And so, uh, people get that confused. And then sometimes people use it and say, well, it wasn't time for Jesus to begin his ministry. Well, if that's true, then there's a problem. 
Because if Jesus told Mary, it's not my time to start my ministry, but I'll do it anyway, that would be wrong. So it's, this has nothing to do with his death, has nothing to do with starting his ministry. It's basically just a common phrase like we today would say, was not my turn. Mm -hmm. Who, who's next to, to get stuff here? Well, it's, it's his turn, it's not mine. Well, can you get it? Well, it's not my turn. You know? And so, it wasn't the term of respect. My eyes are to come. It's customary for the guests to provide things for the feast. So, when a guest would come, they wouldn't just bring the so-called present, but they might bring food, they might bring wine, they might bring bread, whatever it might be. And they say, they're running out, can, okay, uh, who's next to bring stuff? Okay, it's my turn, I'll bring it. And Mary said, they're out of wine. Well, Mom, is, you know, what have I to do with that? It's not my time. So, very customary. So, there were, they had a certain order of doing things. In John 2, 4, he says, Woman, what did the minority not yet come? In John 7, 30, Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And because of that phrase, people want to say, well, that's exactly, that means the same thing. And it doesn't. Uh, then John 8, these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hand, hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. So it's not, it wasn't his time to be arrested, it wasn't his time to be taken, it wasn't his time to die, it wasn't his time to, uh, uh, as far as saying this was time to start his earthly ministry, no, that's not what it meant. It simply just meant, not my turn. Okay. Uh, so it's not time. It's good for anything, a common phrase that we use today. So it's not my turn to do this. Uh, so, you know, you can't get caught up on the phrase. Because if you do, then, then Jesus lied when he said, it's not my time. Or he went against God's will when God said, you know, wanted to start his earthly ministry at a certain time. And Jesus like. It's not my time to start my earthly ministry, but for mom, for your sake, I'll go ahead and start my earthly ministry. No, can't do that, because that would go against God's plan as well. But it makes a lot more sense for him to say, well, it's not my turn to do that. Um, so again, customary for the guests provide things for the feast, but again, a certain order. Plan. So again, not my, time, not my time. As far as the amount uh, of wine, it's quite a bit amount of wine. The Bible says brought six pots, which were 20 or 30 gallons, or the Bible says two or three firkins each. I don't know if term we use today, so I definitely had to look up a firkin, and uh, they estimate anywhere between 20 to 30, so even nobody's really sure how much a firkin was, since it's not. But these were filled to the brim, filled with water, and brought before Jesus at that time. The impact, uh, apparently the, it was a, a good tasting wine. And again, we're not talking a high alcohol content. Uh, very, very low alcohol content. Uh, as all wine was at that time, I don't know what percentage, but just being probably a couple percentage, percent of alcohol. Uh, because again, it's not stored anywhere. If, if it, you did store it, I guess you can store it underground and keep it cool for a little while. but not that long uh, uh, before it started turning to vinegar. Uh, unless it was distilled like the glucose in Acts chapter 2 when they accused Peter and the disciples of being drunk. The master there stated he served the good wine last. You know, why, why bring this? You know, what we had before wasn't as good as this. Usually we serve the, the good first and it goes downhill from there. But, Again, has nothing, really not much to do with the story, but it did have everything to do with the impact on the disciples. And that's the purpose of the miracle here. It's not that it was wine, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, it's like uh, Romans chapter 7, it starts off, it says, if a woman be married to uh, one man and then she marries another, that should be called an adulteress. And people jump on that and say, oh, well, that's uh, adultery if somebody's married, divorced, or adulterer, and, and this and that, all that. And they don't even read what the passage says. And the, pa the, the illustration in Romans chapter 7 is not about marriage, divorce, or adultery. It, it illustrates the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
But people get so caught up in the illustration, they forget what the illustration means. In fact, if you read it, it doesn't say anything about divorce. It says, if a woman be married to one man and then marries another. Well, that's not divorce. That's bigamy. You, know, you can't be married to two people at the same time. That's common. It was the Roman law on that day, and it was the Jewish law on that day. You can't be married to two people at the same time. And Jesus is simply saying, you can't be married to the law and married to grace at the same time, or married to church at the same time. You gotta, uh, if the law is dead, yes, you can go to the church. But if the law is not dead, then you can't go to the church. But the law is dead, or it's finished. Jesus completed the law. So people get caught up in that illustration and forget the purpose of the illustration. And that's what happens here. People get so caught up with the alcohol, whether they drink or don't drink, or why we should drink or not drink, which, you know, you can argue that point, I guess, but get to why this miracle took place. It took place because it was the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the impact upon his mother, but also the impact upon the disciples. That Jesus, the Old Testament told us when the Messiah come, that he'd be following by signs and wonders. Now, they're seeing them. So their faith was strengthened at that time. Jesus here, uh, actually, uh, Matthew chapter 9, we'll go ahead and stop right here because that's where we stopped at in the morning class.